Hello everyone, this is Marius from the GeoDesign course and welcome to the final episode of this series. So when the camera was turned off, I went ahead and, I'm, and added a few more surfaces over here and refined it a little bit. You can also see in the prospector and under the tool space over here, I have created many more surfaces. Some of them relate to grading, some of them are just temporary because I was pasting them into, into other surfaces. And then I have this finished ground final surface over here. At the moment it has contours style, display style turned on, so I can select it and show you in the object viewer roughly how it looks like. So I have started with the existing ground to paste it in and then gradually added different smaller surfaces to it. So you can see there's my river corridor over here, there's my staircase over here, and sometimes it helps uh, to change the display style. So let's go with conceptual maybe, oh, it's not really better, shade of edges. Uh, I would need to change that first to triangles over here to be able to see the triangles in the object viewer as well. Uh, maybe this is a little bit more readable with these colors. Anyway, so we have the staircase which is integrated. I also used some grading to grade into the river embankment. My river embankment is designed with one, two, three, four, five feature lines and then also some grading tying into the existing ground. On the north side of the river, it's a little bit more subtle. You can't really see it that well over here. Uh, but there's, for example, over here, it's cutting into the, the essentially it's an error on the surface because it, the bridge, the pedestrian bridge and bicycle bridge that we have, have over here should not be represented as a solid solid extrusion but then because of the tin surface definition this is how it comes across uh, so it's sort of like cutting through it over here with a fairly steep slope on the other side though like this is my top uh, top feature line that, uh, that that i used to define my river surface and then i added some fill slope over here and and also over there uh, cut so you can see that it's going further out into the existing ground. There's also my triangularly shaped platform, which was almost flat. And you can also see that also this one has some, uh, some grading going on, which ties it in, into the existing ground. And my path over here that's following along the, the river edge it has its own elevation and then it also has grading that matches the, the proposed surface in this case. And then, so it's not necessarily the best idea to design it like that. I just wanted to show you that, that it's possible to, with your grading, to target proposed surfaces as well, right? So first I have created this, this river surface and which was tied into the existing one and then I created the proposed path surface and made it great to the intermediate river surface and then I pasted them all into the FG file. Similarly, I have worked here with, with these two um, islands and I only defined the bottom part of it which is essentially a flat contour line and then I added some grading to find the, the river surface over here. One more thing that I have added is this beautiful hole in the ground. It's supposed to represent a pond. And uh, if I just zoom out and change the display style back to contours, you can see it's represented over here. And it's exactly the same principle as I mentioned. We have a feature line and then this feature line that has been offset multiple times to and then while using the stepped offset command over here I was just entering 
elevation values that were below the the other one. So offsetting inwards and then going down rather than up as we would do with with uh, the islands examples over here. So this is essentially all the features that we were supposed to have. We have some hills, we have some holes in the ground, we have some staircases, we have our river, we have flat platforms, and we have a path. So now that we have put all of it together into this FG final surface, we would like to export it to GIS to perform a similar flow lines analysis as you did with Thomas a few weeks ago. And then the difference would be to, to look at the proposed ground and then analyze it and then try to understand how does water behave on this side. So the way to do it is just under the prospector tool, tool space over here, um, we just right click on the name of the surface that we want to export. In my case, it's FG final, right click on the name and you just say export to DEM. DEM is an abbreviation for digital elevation model. So just select that. And we're presented with some, yet another menu over here. And yes, this is FG file. This is how we want to name it. The drawing coordinate zone, because we have established it at the very beginning, it automatically um, inputs that for us. And then we just want to name it uh, somehow and then find a folder for it to, to save it. So I just need to click this little icon over here, put it in a, a location that makes sense for us. In my case, uh, I'll just go to my um, desktop and then my geodesign output. And I would like to save it as a FG final. But I want to make sure that I'm saving it as a TIFF file, not a DEM. So by default, it will ask you to save it as a DEM file. You want it to be a TIFF, geo TIFF, and then save. And then, so right now we have established the directory where to save to. And what we still need to do is just estimate, um, tell Civil 3D how dense this um, surface is supposed to be. And then, because we're saving it as a raster format, then we can have only control about the spacing over the spacing over here. And if we, if I was to do like final quality analysis, I would probably go like 25 centimeters distance, but just to keep it, uh, keep it fast, this export process, it would take a little bit longer um, if, if we selected uh, lower values. So let's just start with course five meters. Just mind you, five meters doesn't make any sense over here because our path is two meters wide, so we would completely lose it over here. But for the sake of the tutorial, I'm just hitting it here so that the export process um, doesn't take too long. But I would encourage you to uh, go with maybe 25 centimeters, export that, and then you can perform the analysis using the, exactly the same procedure in ArcGIS that you have already learned. Okay, so that's step number one. The next step would be to look at how would we calculate volumes of the surface. And there's two kinds of volumes calculations that we can perform. One is, uh, let's start with the very basic one, where we have created this pond, as I already mentioned, that we would just like to understand how much water can it hold. And um, for this particular kind of analysis to work, we need to have some contour lines. So, so we couldn't, uh, first of all, we need to select the, the surface that we're interested in. So uh, I wouldn't like to perform this analysis on the FG final, which has everything in it. What I would like it uh, to be is a little bit more of a concentrated analysis. And then I would select my FG pond in this case, my surface properties are at the moment set to contours one, and half, uh, one meter and five meters. If it was set to triangles like this, I wouldn't be able to perform the analysis that I'm interested in. So what I would like to do is, first of all, I'll turn off the, um, the FG final so that it doesn't get in the way. And I will select my FG pond surface over here 
and change its display style to contours 1 and 5 mirrors. And then what I can do is under the, uh, I need to be in the Civil 3D workspace, under the Analyze tab, under Design, there is this hidden command called Stage Storage. And it has, a lot, again, a lot of um, options. We don't really care about these. The only one that we care about is we need to define the basin somehow that we're interested in. So hit this button and then just say define basin from contours, surface contours, which is uh, the default, and hit define again. And now we're prompted to select the, the actual surface. So I need to hover over that, select my thin surface over here. And I can see that because I only have two contour lines visible, um, it calculated the volume. Uh, let me just make that a little bit bigger here and uh, average here. So we can see that there is an increment depth, four and five meters, and then it tells me that using different, two different types of calculations, one is averaging end area uh, volume, the other one is conic, doesn't really matter, they should be very close to each other. And you can see that, well, either it has around 15 cubic meters worth of storage. But like this is not enough resolution, and the reason for that is that we would like to have a little bit better picture of it. The reason for this is that there is not enough contour lines for it to work with. So let's just cancel out of here and then select the thin surface again. And we can see that we have this um, style that, that's very coarse. It only shows us contours that are at least one meter apart. So what we can do is just create another surface style and then make sure that we're editing it over here. Let's just call it contours fine under information and make sure that, that under the contours tab, we go under contour intervals. Let's just make it a little bit bigger over here so you can see it. And then let's put minor into interval to 0 0.1 meters. Let's just make sure that under plan, both our contours are visible. Hit OK, hit OK. And now we can see that the picture is much more uh, defined, that we have a much better resolution. And now we can rerun the analysis under Analyze, Design, Stage Storage. Again, define basin, define, and then select the surface. And now you can see that we have so much more data. And then in the end, both this column and that column are showing us around 36 cubic meters. So this is what we're interested in. And we have two options now. We can uh, either you know, create this A report and then send, uh, send it to a text file. So let's just do it quickly. Again, my geodesign output stage storage txt, t, uh, text file. And then maybe you want to perform some calculations with that in, in an Excel sheet. You can do it or you can just send it to your fellow colleagues working on um, on drainage design. And for example, like you actually want to have 30 cubic meters worth of storage. So, so you'd be interested in, in this contour line and then you would say anything below that, um, sorry, anything above that is actually wasted. So maybe we can change it. And you can see that uh, this is the cumulative performance. So at three point uh, or at, uh, at level four, which is half a meter above the bottom of it, we only have around three cubic meters worth of storage. And then one meter higher, which would be here, we have already 19 and so on. And so it gives you an insight into what's happening there. But we can also just hit insert over here and we'll be prompted to select a point in the drawing or just click somewhere else and then uh, close out of here. And then the, the exact same table is uh, inserted over here as a, an AutoCAD table. This table uh, is by no means parametric, it's just a static representation. So if I were to, to change the, the surface, this table wouldn't update, I would have to recreate it again. So um, again, to, to be able to work with that, I need more resolution in terms of contours. But now that I'm done with it, I can just change it back to my uh, regular contours and I can go back to displaying my FD final 
so I, I would need to go to right click on it surface properties right because it was to no display I'll put it to contours one five design but right, because I already have this uh, this style over here I can also just show you how the whole site would look like if we were to apply very very fine contours right and you can see that the existing ground is quite jagged because it was never smooth uh, but the, the features that we have introduced over here you know all these islands uh, the grading over here uh, our our staircases are very nicely graded including obviously this this particular point over here this might be too much of visual clutter so let's go over here and um, so the next kind of calculation that we'll be interested in is we would try to understand how much cut and fill is needed to create the surface that, that we just uh, you know, designed and uh, is it economically feasible to do in the first place so again under the analyze tab, tab we would go to the volumes dashboard and we're presented with another window that at the moment is empty and then what we need to do is we need to create a comparison surface between the existing ground and the finished ground final you could also do that for indiv individual steps in between if you wanted to understand what is the contribution of these islands you could just select these but let's just um, let's just show you how it works so we need to select the third icon from the left create a new volume surface and then um, just give it a name so let's just say uh, EGFG uh, because this is the two that I'm comparing don't worry about the display style what's important here is to say what is the base surface for me the base surface is actually the existing ground because I want to compare against it and which one am I comparing so I'm comparing my FG final and then the cut and fill factor uh, let's leave it leave them as one they are meant to uh, counter the fact that you know when you're the soil is compacted and then when you take it out and just dump it somewhere it's actually going to be expanded so it takes more volume than it would underground and then you could counter for this uh, using different factors over here but as long as we have it at one uh, we're on the safe side and then Civil Free needs to work on it for a while and then um, what happened uh, are two things first of all this window has been populated with some numbers as well and then under surfaces there is a different surface that we created and you can tell that it has a different icon as well this shows me that this is a volume tin surface not a regular tin surface so this uh, is looking at the differences between tin surfaces in terms of volumes and then you can also see over here that this is my cut in cubic meters which is 19,000 I'm cutting and I'm filling 1600 cubic meters and here we have a little bit of an overview uh, like the difference between these is 17,886 cubic meters worth of cut and if I click this first icon over here um, and I have um, the, exactly the same information that's presented to me in a slightly more condensed form so it tells me total cut total fill and what is the the balance between that right so here it's, it's I mean it's quite obvious uh, I cut in this you know tremendously big shape of a river into the existing ground and I only essentially filled one or two of these um, these uh, islands and then there was a little bit of fill needed for for my graded surfaces towards the towards the the paths over here so like this is by no means a good quality design i probably should spend a little bit more time optimizing that and trying to make sure that you know this net number over here in the end is as close to zero as possible uh, but this is how how we will work on it but then as i also mentioned we don't necessarily have to compare like two big surfaces to each other what we could do is we could create another one over here and say you know what let's just compare existing ground to islands 
and then my base surface in this case is again existing ground and my comparison surface would be my fg temp island here these two temp island and okay and now um, i can turn this one off so that uh, it doesn't confuse because it, there's there's these check boxes over here and then this summary is trying to look at the sum of all of these but this would be a little bit of double counting so i can turn off the first one and then just see exactly what it's doing my island number one that i'm looking at uh, is essentially you know only filling so it's on always above the existing ground surface and i have 1264 cubic meters worth of fill just to just to build this surface and in this way you could create multiple comparison surfaces over here to try to understand what's going on let me just delete that uh, leave the one that i'm interested in and then also over here i would just right click and delete the one that i don't want anymore um, and then maybe there you know like i would like to visually understand where it is that i'm cutting where it is that i'm filling because right now i have the numbers under the volumes dashboard I can bring them up at any time, but I would like to visually see where the interventions are ha happening. So I, what I can do is I can right click on my EGFG surface and change its style to use elevation bending. And when I apply it, it will you know, perform like some coloring of, of different surfaces while staying in the same tab surface properties rather than being in the information tab i can switch to the analysis tab make sure that i'm working with elevations analysis type elevations and then what i can do is i can uh, i can then say you know what like give me three uh, colors over here and then so first of all i would need to set this number number of ranges to three and then i would need to hit this little arrow to run the analysis and now what civil 3 is saying is well you know what i have three colors for you and then this is my guess on how you would like them to be grouped so it says that this is the minimum elevation and i would like it to go to uh, minus 0 0.05 so very close to zero and then this would be minus 0 0.005 and all the way to zero zero five on the plus side and this would be zero zero five to the max and i want everything that's zero to be white there's no transparency here that i can choose so I, i'll just call it white and then everything that i that's above is plus so essentially what i'm doing is i want to hit apply over here i want to display all the information that's below zero right so which is uh, an intervention that's below the existing ground I want it to be red and everything that's above zero with a little bit of error margin of five centimeters I want it to be green and you know intuitively when we think about it then it matches our intuition so everywhere where we didn't do anything it's white and when we this is my pond over here so it's definitely a red surface because it's cutting into it the same thing with the river apparently my platform also was mostly cutting into the existing ground and then there is one island over here there's the tip of the other island and these are higher than the existing ground and also uh, a few sections here and there are higher than the existing ground so we're filling so this is just a visual representation of um, of uh, where um, where our interventions occur and we can also select the same egfg surface and it performs as any other surface in civil 3d so we can add some spot elevations to it and then just click wherever we want and then it's actually telling us what is the difference so these would be it's a bit unfortunate with my cursor which is green and disappears on the green uh, and also white text and white is not really readable but um, if i zoom in on that 
this uh, tells me that I have 50 centimeters worth of cut, uh, sorry, fill, and this tells me that I'm here minus 1.8, minus 2.3 meters, and so on. And these labels, again, they are, they are uh, dynamic, so I can just move them around and observe. So the closer I get to white, the closer I should be to zero, right? This is zero. Okay, let me just um, delete. Oh, maybe not delete it, but uh, I'll just uh, change the style to no display, hit OK to hide it, and then I'll uh, get rid of a few of these labels that I don't want to distract me while I'm, I'm doing other work over here. <clears throat> so these would be um, like very simple calculations that we can do with volumes and, um, and also stage storage for estimating what is the capacity of our, our ponding features. Next step on the list would be to look at, remember last time I showed you how to create, uh, create quick profiles using a line um, that uh, served as a, as a base to understand what the geom geometry is doing. But uh, these profiles would each time would have uh, hit a save button, they would disappear. Uh, so what is a more persistent way of uh, creating sections through, uh, through different terrain models, different surfaces? Well, we can still use a line to do it, but then what we need to do is we can, uh, we need to create an intermediate um, object that the same way we can really operate on polylines to create surfaces, we need to create polylines to feature lines, the same way we can create, uh, we can convert lines or polylines to so-called alignment. And so again, under the Home tab, create Design menu, uh, just hit Alignment, uh, create alignment from objects. Which objects do I want to use? This is the line over here. Uh, it asks me about the direction. Um, so if it's this way, this will be the left side, this will be the right side of it. If I want to reverse, uh, then this is uh, the left side and that's the right side of my cross section. And uh, let's just call it section line so that um, it's easy for us to understand what this one is doing. We can essentially accept all the defaults. We don't really care about them. And what happened is, uh, you know, right now not much has changed, but what we can do right now is we can select our um, FG final surface and rather than selecting the quick profile over here which is exactly the same as uh, right clicking with a line selected and saying quick uh, um, okay I would have to have a line rather than a line here so when I had a line selected right click and say quick profile, then I can select my surface and rather than clicking the same button over here, I can say create profile. And because I already have one alignment over here, I'm able to do it. Otherwise it wouldn't have allowed me to do it and perform this operation. So I only have one alignment that's called section line. And now I'm being asked which surface do I want to cut through? I want to cut from my FG final, so I can. I have to select it over here, and then I need to add it to the list because this particular profile can be sort of like sampling different surfaces. I only want this one, and then I can click OK. This is important. If I click OK, nothing will happen. I need to uh, click this button, draw in profile view, and again, there's a lot of settings that we could go through. We'll just accept the default, and then uh, here create profile view and again I just zoom out uh, I'm asked to select the origin point for the profile view and you can see it's here um, it might look for you differently um, remember we have created this landscape view display style you might have uh, still something like major grids 
which has some uh, exaggeration to it. So please refer to the previous video on how to create a landscape or a non-exaggerated view for the profile view. And if you feel like it, you can definitely go into pro the, the profile view properties and then, you know, uh, there's different different settings over here that you could adjust. Civil 3D is all about settings and then you, could, uh, you could change the appearance of this particular one. Uh, I will not be explaining that in these uh, videos, but if you uh, don't like the appearance of it, please do explore other options on how to change it. And here we can go to our split view so that we uh, we can look at both at the same time. So in the top I would have my surface profile and at the bottom I would have my alignment. Then and you can see that it's an automatically um, updating connection between these two, right? So if I make it shorter, it will cut off half of it. And then remember uh, the direction, because I, I flip the direction, I tell you this is a this portion corresponds to the left side of the um, of the profile. So we're looking at it from this way rather than the other. Okay. And uh, the great thing is just to prove the point, I'll just hit save and uh, this particular uh, profile remains in the drawing. So you can also, you know, you can do many things to it. You can, uh, as I mentioned, change the display styles. You can also just explode it. Um, like a um, normal um, compound block and then work like so just to show you so I'll just hit type explode over here and then what happened is the uh, the section the profile disappeared because we need to start exploding this one first I believe yes um, so so now I have the section line but the other one disappears so sort of like you would need to um, create a copy of that, explode the profile first, then explode the grid later, and then you can modify it as any geometry in AutoCAD. I would not recommend that. It's great to have the, uh, the automatic connection over here. If you want to change the location of the line, you would uh, like to um, the profile to be automatically updated. Um, okay. Let's maximize this viewport so, so that we have a little bit more screen in real estate. This line doesn't do anything, so I can delete it. But uh, right now it's it's also, you know, no one would understand that this particular line is a, is a section line. So what you would need to do is, you know, add a few arrows, um, sh change the display style of this particular line, so maybe label it so that everyone knows that this particular line corresponds to a section line somewhere in the drawing. Okay, we're moving fast over here. We have created some alignments and we have mm, created some profile views. What if we wanted to do some different kind of visualization <coughs> of, uh, of these features? So what we, uh, what we would like to do maybe is um, like each time I look at this surface, so let me just have a look at it over here. You know, it's gray, right? And then even if I change the uh, the colors over here, like it doesn't doesn't show me any any texture to it. Um, and remember at the beginning. So if I just type in layer, in my particular case, my K raster layer was frozen. This is where I had all the images that I imported. Uh, so both my sketch, which is somewhere hidden over there, so I'll just turn it off, and my um, satellite image. So what I can do is, if I look at the image and the surface in Object Viewer, you could see that they are, I mean, they are on completely different levels right but what i can do is i can ask civil 3d when i select the surface to so in this context sensitive menu under surface tools you have an option to drape an image over the surface 
So essentially, you click on that, and then it asks you which image you, I only have two images uh, in the drawing. So which one do I want to work with? I know that my satellite image is this R23, and which surface do I want to drape it on? I want it to be on the FG final, for example, and then, you know, accept the default over here. And now I just need to select that, go to the object viewer. It's going to take a while, but you can see that it immediately draped the image over it. For, for you to be able to see the effect, you need to be in the realistic um, view over here because any other one, any other will not work, but realistic will show you the, the result. It doesn't really make sense to, to do it, uh, what I'm just doing right now, right? Um, it would make sense to drape it over the existing ground, but not really over the proposed ground where, for example, this road over here is being draped over my new river, right? The same, the same way over here, I, I proposed some steps uh, cutting into it. Uh, so, but what you could do is you could, for example, create a texture in Photoshop and then paint uh, paint all the um, all the new textures. I don't know, like add some gravel over here, maybe some vegetation, add some um, you know other features that you don't want to model. Just just um, put them in as a JPEG, and then you already know how to scale and position a JPEG in a 3D model, and then you could drape the surface over this, uh, this new model that you have created. Okay, I'll just undo it because, uh, so just undo the, the draping because I don't really care about it that much. And then I'll turn off the, the raster layer, but this is how you would do it. And then next step would be, you would like to populate your surface with some you know, three dimensional geometry. So let's say, Let's plant a, plant a few trees and then maybe let's add some furniture to your to your design. Mm, to do that, you would need to access the so-called palette. Uh, so under the Civil 3D tab, Home, and then make sure that you have this button, Tool Palette, activated. Uh, there's a shortcut, Control 3 as well. And in my case, right now it's off, now it's on, and in my case it pops up over here. It can be different uh, for you. It can pop up on the left-hand side. It can be somewhere else hidden. So just you know, click on it once or twice and see which menu is changing and you'll be able to lo locate it. And then when you hover over it, and then it definitely is going to look differently for you because I have my office standards over here. But then it's important how you can navigate to, uh, to the so-called multi-view blocks. This is what we're looking for. Right click on this darker brown, uh, gray uh, bar. So you need to right click over here. If you right click here, you won't be able to, to navigate, switch between different palettes. So right click on the darker bar over here, and then either it will be saved for you in this list, or you will have a separate list that says Civil 3D and Civil MV Multi-View Blocks. This is just because of my German standard from the office, but it should say something like multi-view blocks, MV blocks, civil 3D uh, multi-view blocks, something like that, search for that. And once you're in, you will be presented with a few tabs over here that you can, like when you click on these, you, you're able to switch between them. And for those of you who don't know what that is, it's essentially just shortcuts where different models uh, have been saved and then you can just uh, click for example I want to plant a tree a deciduous tree uh, large O2 and I click on it once and I wait for a little while and then my cursor right now has a, a tree attached to it and I click once again to position it and one more time to rotate it and so this way I can plant let's just plant two or three different trees over here. So rotation, and let's just do a concept tree as well here. 
and then I would move to um, uh, let's go external works and then I'll just scroll down a little bit and there is seating and let's just take bench number one as well and then one uh, one click to position it second click to rotate okay so what we are presented with are is a typical block view because we're in top view but when I select it here I um, I can see what is the uh, the name of that uh, particular block but what's more interesting if I select it and right click and go to the object viewer and then go to the 3d view I can see it's three-dimensional representation right so depending on which block we have selected we we might have a more advanced or less advanced representation so this particular tree looks like that whereas this one um, you see it's just represented by by a like essentially two planes crossing each other so it, it really depends which ones you take I know that the concept trees they are fairly well developed and so if you take both of them and the bench into the object viewer and I can see that I have actual proper 3d geometry okay so let's just delete the ones that are not that nice and only keep the ones that I like and then I'll select three blocks over here and let me select the surface as well and take them all to the object viewer and now you know what's happening right they are all at zero elevation whereas my surface is a little bit higher so I would like to move them to the uh, to the surface and the way to do it is again I select the surface in the context sensitive menu exactly where we're draping images over surfaces there is another button here move the surface click on it and then move blocks to surface and then I have uh, essentially four different blocks the asterisk t72 is probably something that came uh, while I imported the, the old ones but I can select all three over here uh, so I click on the first one and shift click on the last one hit OK and then now when I take my blocks and the surface into the object viewer I can see when I zoom in over here that all the all three blocks have been moved to their respective elevations uh, corresponding to the to where the surface was um, you can say that it's a bit you know tedious to, to work like this so what I can also do is I can just shift hold shift and then hold my middle mouse wheel then rotate the perspective of the viewport and then rather than being in the 2d wireframe I can change this particular view to realistic and and now I can I can just move around and pan in the viewport right so uh, so again like when I hold my middle mouse wheel it pans when I hold shift and use the mouse wheel then I can uh, I can orbit around and um, it might the, the colors might look a little bit differently to you uh, you need to be in the realistic mode to because for example if you're in 2d wireframe then it would look like that right so you need to go to the realistic view and then what you might want to do is you you might want to type start typing environment but then go render environment and depending on this slider over here exposure it might appear darker or brighter so make sure that you know you find a sweet spot that works for you and then um, leave it uh, leave it there okay uh, is this um, is this um, correlation between the the blocks and the the um, the surfaces is it dynamic uh, it is not so when I go to my vertical I'll just split my screen right now vertically and then on the left hand side I'll just uh, look at it from the top view so that's easier for me to move things around while on the right hand side still being in the 
in the perspective view. And let's just switch back to my wireframe so that I know where I am. And uh, let's move this. Uh, let's move this tree to my to where the hill is over here, to the top of the hill. And going back to the other viewport, I'll just move it, and you can see that the the tree kept the the old elevation. So each time I I make a change like that, I would again have to select the surface, make sure that I only have the surface selected, no no other things, and then I would need to re, uh, redo the same command, move blocks to surface, uh, which ones, I don't know which ones, so I'll just move all of them, and you can see that the tree popped back into place. Okay, so let's maximize the, the viewport. Um, so essentially what you would, uh, you would now do is you would you know plant your trees wherever you want them to be, and then uh, you can easily just you know start uh, start uh, select one, copy uh, where to copy from, where to copy to, and then you can just click click click. You know if I want to have them residing along my my path over here to create a nice boundary, and then I would just uh, select one of these, uh, move to surface, move blocks to surface, all of them, bam, and then if I want to have a look at them, I'll just select one, right click, select similar, and uh, select the surface, object viewer, give it a little while to update, and you can see all my trees are exactly what, they want, what I want them to be. Sometimes there is some glitches with the display. You see, it takes it a while to refresh and then regenerate, even though I'm in the realistic view. Um, if it doesn't show your colors, you know, switch between them, and it should uh, should update. If it doesn't, it might be you know something with the graphics card or the connection. But essentially, this would be the procedure to populate your design with more um, features, and then the same thing with your benches. And then I've only shown you a few of these blocks over here. Uh, what you can definitely do is you can download some from from the internet, or you can also create your own. There will be tutorials on, on how you would create your own blocks. Uh, but the keyword to, to search for is multi-view block. And um, yeah, so this is essentially how how you would create these uh, like very very basic. Um, visualizations, right? So either you know just shift rotate into into the perspective view, and then navigate around depending on on the performance of, of your computer. It can be faster or or a little bit slower. Change the change the switch to the realistic view, and um, you know change the render environment, um, the exposure setting. And um, then you can see that this is essentially what I have over here. Maybe some of the things I would I would like to turn off, like these um, the building footprints over here. Maybe I would like to import the buildings from another GIS source to uh, to create some context for uh, for my drawing. So I actually want to turn off or freeze the layer with the polylines. So that they, they don't get in the way, and then this way, you know, you could just create a few screenshots of of your uh, projects, and then this would be a very very basic way of visualizing, showing showing a perspective visualization of what you're trying to achieve. There are much uh, more sophisticated ways of of uh, visualizing uh, landscapes. I would not recommend using Civil 3D for anything that's you know even remotely close to realistic uh, rendering. Uh, there is a rendering pane over here, but it's actually, uh, you know, the, the results are not worth it. So what I would suggest is uh, using a dedicated piece of software like uh, Lumion, maybe Blender, maybe, uh, maybe 3ds Max, you name it. So create your terrains over here, add some features, export it out from here, Move in there. Even Revit would be much better uh, for uh, for the real visual visualizations. 
but for symbolic representations as the one that I just showed you that's perfectly fine okay so now that we have everything covered uh, in the modeling section we want to actually produce some you know 2d representations or, or a printout a layout so so far if you look at the lower uh, left corner over here we have been everything that we did we either did in the model space this is the model space or we took objects to the object viewer which is a separate window but then to the right of it there's a layout tab and then by default it looks probably something like that when you right click on the layout and go to page setup manager uh, you would see that this is a uh, an a4 sized um, page that this particular layout re represents so essentially if you want to create a map representation or a plan view or a section view and then have it printed out we we'll need to create in the layout space there is ways some people you know, do it in the model space I disagree with this, this approach in general uh, so do everything uh, in the layout space learn it it will it will you know make your life so much easier um, so first thing that we need to do is we need to make it a little bit bigger so we just modify that and uh, first thing that we're presented with is the option to choose a printer and again this will uh, this will depend on what kind of printers you have installed on your computer but you should have this dwg to pdf printer so we can also just print it straight to jpegs or pngs but let's go with pdf it's so much smarter and then the paper size it depends on the plotter that you have installed or that you have chosen but for dwg to pdf we have all these options over here and for you you're required to deliver uh, a1 size posters so this would be either you know, vertical or horizontal layout i go with horizontal it's up to you which one you decide and um, all these things here uh, you can accept the defaults just pay attention to this one if you have some transparency in your hatches maybe or anything else you need to make sure that this one is checked over here and okay so what i have done right now is i have just essentially created a bigger sheet of paper but it's still empty and then uh, under the layout tools i want to create a viewport that looks into the model space from the paper space uh, so i just go to the um, drop down menu over here under layout viewports and then i'll select rectangular i could create other other shapes as well but i'll just draw a rectangle to begin with and now it like what silver 3 did, did is it tried to you know put everything in there uh, and show me at once and then now this is an important distinction if i'm outside you know my uh, zooming and panning commands they work on the paper but if i double click inside you can see that the frame becomes thicker and now my zooming and panning commands they operate on the model space inside right um, so I would like to zoom in maybe on this particular section and then I need to double click outside and then I can again work work there um, so single click doesn't only select but double click on the inside allows me to navigate the, the model space inside okay so what I could do is obviously I could just you know try and eyeball it with my with my mouse and say ah, this is what I would like to roughly see over there but then this is not the way uh, how how we want to operate we want to have more precision so when i select the viewport so again i'm like double click outside of it and then i select the viewport and then i should have this scale of the select viewport um, menu over here if it's not visible use the hamburger menu and it should be here under viewport scale you need to make sure that this is checked so click on the menu here and it allows you to choose um, what scale you would like to present the information in so let's say i would like to have an overview in one to thousand 
and right now it's exactly 1 to 1000 and then I can lock it. Uh, so this, this little lock icon, now if I double click inside I cannot move it at all, right? Because I have locked it to the, to the view and to the scale. If I unlock it here, I can freely move it around, I can zoom in and out and you can see it messes up the scale. So it's not accurate anymore. Um, okay, so I know I would like it to be 1 to 1000, but I would also like it to be rotated because right now it's a bit unfortunate, it's, it's taking so much space over here. You can see here, I have this little navigation cube and then it, uh, it says WCS, so World Coordinate System, and there's this little arrow right next to it. If I click on that, I can create a new user coordinate system. So right now, now this sheet is world aligned, but if I click new and it says, okay, specify the origin and I just click, uh, let's say over here, and then I can rotate to define where the X axis, how it should go. So I, I would like it to be a little roughly like that. And then what's the point uh, on the X, Y plane to, for the X, Y, uh, for the Y direction, I just accept the default. And now what it did is has changed the, uh, the coordinate system over here. You can see my cursor has tilted, but uh, the view hasn't changed. So to do that, I need to type in plan, P-L-A-N, hit OK, and then enter an option for which one I want it to be the current UCS. And now it will rotate everything to use this, uh, the one, um, the coordinate system that I have just created. Okay, so now double click outside, select it from the outside, change it to 1000, and let's see, let's say that I like what I see, and so let's lock it. I can still trim it a little bit because I don't want to show this much. So let's say I'm only interested in this portion of my design. So I have it. And then I can just select it and then move it around just using the move command, right? So select it, move, and then that's it behaves like a regular object in AutoCAD. Okay, there's a few things that I don't like about what's happening right now in this drawing. So first thing is my labels are just huge and they're also tilted to the side. So what I can do is I, I have two, two options. Either I go back to the model view and then I select them and then here I'm looking at everything in the annotation scale. Again, if you don't see it, you would need to find it um, somewhere in this in this menu here, annotation scale. This is the one that, uh, that you need to have turned on. Um, so annotation scale right now, it's set to one to 250, but our drawing is one to 1000. So if I set it to one to 1000 and give it a moment, this is the size that we are seeing in the other viewport as well. So this is way too big. But so either we would make the changes over here or we can go back to the layout and, and now we can already see that, um, that it has updated, but I want to double click inside and I can show you that I can select these, um, I can still modify objects within the viewport. I can also draw, for example, I could be drawing a polyline inside in the drawing, no problem. Um, but I want to select one of these elevation labels and I want to edit not its marker style, but its uh, label style, which is over here. And I just uh, want to edit the existing one, edit the existing one. And there's two things that I, I can change over here. One is under the layout, there's te text height. Right now it's set, set to 2.54 millimeters, which might be a little bit too big. I'll just set it to 1.54 and then hit OK, hit OK. And you can see that um, they are much smaller right now. The other thing though, they're still rotated. I wouldn't like them to be rotated. So I click that, I go back to the create edit, again edit, and then not in the layout, but under general, there is orientation reference. And right now it's set to object and by object, 
and this this little marker is meant. I can click on it and say, actually, I want it to be rotated to the view. And apply, OK, OK, and now all the all the text has been rotated. And you can do the same thing for the um, for the marker style as well. So you could uh, go all the way down, create edit, you know, and under marker, you want to change it this style to be something smaller as well. Okay, okay, and then this way, you know, you can you can update the the view of your or the graphical representation of of what you'll be doing. Okay, but this is um, this is you know not really filling the entire sheet over here. Um, but then the, the beauty of this kind of workflow is that you can put multiple viewports on a sheet and you can uh, also implement different drawing styles to them. So let's just uh, create another one and say rectangular over here. I'll just select it and just to prove a point I'll just make it much bigger <clears throat> for the pur purpose of the exercise. And let's say I would like to actually focus and here I want to be back in the uh, world coordinate system and I want to focus on this table for whatever reason right so I can just trim it over here and and have have it there right then next uh, viewport that I would like to introduce again um, let's say I would like to have my profile in place and then because Let's say this is one to five hundred. One to five hundred, and then you see um, sometimes if we just zoom in like that, then the numbers would be a little bit off. What we can then do is we can just go and click outside and say region all. It would regenerate all the viewports, and then it will update the the numbers. You can see see it here, right? The size of the of the font has changed. So now we will have our profile somewhere. And by the way, this is a terrible, terrible uh, layout that I'm proposing right now. I'm just showcasing what is what is possible and not spending any time trying to make it look nice. And another idea would be to introduce yet another viewport. And rather than looking, uh, all of these are displaying information in a uh, like essentially in two dimensions, but I can just shift rotate while being in the viewport and um, you know change the perspective view and rather than working with wireframe, I could work with realistic over here. And then this will take a while for, for it to update. But now I have this realistic representation of my um, of my surface right? and, and the objects as well that I have planted here. So these are my trees and um, I would need to maybe change a few settings here as well. So render environment should help me fix a few issues related over here as well. And this way you could, you know, walk yourself uh, through all the features that you want to show. And the great thing is that all of these are have a set scale, right? So if you want to be operating in a defined scale, like here, one to thousand, I can do the same thing for my uh, for my profile view. So let's say I would like it to be in one to two thousand. Okay, that's way too small. Uh, what is it, like one to five hundred? Uh, and this would be, and I can also lock that so that it doesn't that I don't accidentally change it. Even if I double click, I cannot really move it and, and rotate. So I'll just change the, the viewport over here and just make sure to regen all uh, just to be, to be on the safe side that you see. Again, the, the size of the text has updated. By the way, this is again, like I would probably spend a little bit more time fixing the the actual display style over here, so that it looks better. Um, but this is how I would go through creating all the um, all the layout over here. And then 
now we can switch from Civil 3D, we can switch to drafting and annotation. So the, let's say, classical AutoCAD. And while still being in the, the layout view, I can easily add some text over here. So this would be, for example, uh, perspective view. And, and, and then it has created the text, which is tiny. Um, over here, as you can see, it's just way, way, way too small because text height is 0 0.2 and I don't really know what the unit is, but let's just change it to 20. I guess it's millimeters over here. So maybe 15 millimeters or something, right? Or 10. And then you could uh, you could work on this on this style. What kind of style is that? And you you would like to change the within the style. You could define the font that's being used and so on and so on. Um, what you also want to do uh, again? So select the layout tools over here, uh, especially if you have rotated the the viewport. You want to add a north arrow. So I need to have my uh, layout selected. And then under the layout tools, north arrow. And I'm just presenting with you know multiple arrows over here. Let's just go with this one, click click somewhere. And then again, it creates it, but it's a tiny little thing, right? So I would have to be very, very careful not to miss it. And so it's not really helpful. So I need to select it and then just change its scale to maybe, you know, 550. Let's see what this does. No, way too small. So 500 and 500. Mm, it's still too small. Yeah, still too small. Uh, so maybe it should be then 5,000. Let's see how big this will be. Okay, I believe I just need to regen. Oh. Yeah, okay. Um, so I have exaggerated over here. Probably you would need to go for something like maybe 1,000. And, and this is a dynamic uh, north arrow that's connected to the uh, to this particular viewport. If I change the, the viewport or the orientation of the user coordinate system within the viewport and then hit regen, then this uh, alignment of the nor north arrow would have changed. Same way with the scale bar. If I have a viewport selected, create a scale bar. There's different settings over here. Uh, just make sure that you're taking metric, not imperial. So metric, uh, how many divisions every, I don't know, 25 meters, uh, labels, and so on. And just click over here. And uh, Silver 3D has created this, um, this scale bar. Okay, so this way, I'm pretty sure we have covered everything. Okay, the last one will be the plot. So once everything has been set up and you have spent some time you know arranging these uh, these viewports making sense of them adding proper labels adding north arrows maybe add a um, you know, plan description over here what is it that you're doing the assignment and so on uh, you would like to plot things right so essentially uh, just control p and um, you know because we are, have already set up our paper size as A1. We can choose the quality, let's say maximum quality. Hit OK. Where do we save it? We want to go to my GeoDesign output. Uh, yes, layout one for now. And it's going to print the sheet and give it a moment. Uh, first, it needs to regenerate all the, all the layouts that it sees and then uh, for example you know if there is a three-dimensional perspective view inside then it would also regenerate everything in there and because we also went for the highest quality then it will spend a little bit more time rasterizing everything but once it's done it will save it to my geodesign output Yeah. Uh, it also 
opened it over here. So let me just close uh, close these. And what you can see see here is that you know everything is in place, but some of the you know maybe we don't really want to see these frames that define the viewport. So what we can do is uh, going back to Civil 3D, we can just go to LA layer and we can create a under all used layers let's just create a new and let's, ca let's call it KU and I say I'll call it the viewport layer go back to KU so that I can see it here and then what I want to do is I want to change the color so that it's obvious to me that I'm, I'm working with uh, like my geometry is actually saved from this layer and I can tell it that this layer should not be plotted. So I just click on plot and you see there's this little sign telling us that this particular layer will not be plotted. And now what I can do while being in the paper space again, I can just select all the viewports and then move them to my layer, it will be easier here, to my KU viewport layer. So now all of them are, are have turned cyan. I'll close that and I'll again hit print. I'll just make it you know, uh, preview quality to make things faster. Let's call it layout 2 so that we can compare these two and then hopefully this will print a little bit faster than the previous one. So again give it a moment to regenerate and what would I have um, hopefully achieved is that right now these viewport frames are not going to be visible, they will not be printed. And essentially it's up to you to decide whether you want to lay out everything in the viewport uh, or using the paper space in Civil 3D and add all your annotation over here or whether you want to export these individually and use another layouting program like, like I don't know, InDesign. Yeah, here you can see uh, all these um, all these frames have disappeared because they have been put on a uh, no plot layer. You can also what I haven't shown you is uh, within the like individual viewports you could also just change the display style of uh, of your terrains. So this is um, showing you a contour line. Uh, whatever, like I believe one and two meters uh, display style. Um, this is this is your mesh representation of the same terrain, but you could also um, just have different viewports, and one would be showing maybe triangulated uh, style, another one would be just showing contour lines. Okay, so now your um, the task would be for you to either lay this sheet out in uh, AutoCAD and just have it printed as a PDF or export individual bits and pieces and use I don't know, InDesign or maybe Coral, Coral Draw or Illustrator or whatever you prefer, Microsoft Word if that works for you and, uh, and layout in a poster in uh, A1 format that has all the information that we have listed in the, in the course requirements for the partial assignment. And do make sure that, uh, you know, like when you're importing, exporting things, that the scale is still preserved. It sort of like comes for free within AutoCAD, uh, that you have this 1 to 1000 uh, option to choose over here. You could obviously go to 1 to 500 if you want it to be a little bit more detailed, um, and so on and so forth. But then if you're working with InDesign, just make sure that, uh, you know, everything is also according to scale and that that your scale bar here has updated as well right so you just need to region everything before your uh, you you print okay I hope this helps uh, good luck with the assignment and uh, we are here to help you thank you